not everyone is convinced or comforted by the sort of Christianity that David Haskell described. For 30 years, Josie McSkimming has been a clinical social worker in Sydney. Many of her clients were evangelical Anglicans, and they came to her because conservatives saw her as safe, as one of us. But she began to doubt not the scripture, but the insistence in parts of Sydney's Anglican diocese that there was only one way to understand it. She's written of her experience in a new book called Leaving Christian Fundamentalism. Josie McSkimming is speaking with John Cleary of ABC Local Radio's Sunday Nights program. Particularly in Sydney, since the 1970s, there's been a real resurgence in the Anglican Church, a real commitment to mission, evangelism, to biblical scholarship, as it were. Some would say that it's become increasingly rigid and polemic, negative. So how is that fundamentalist? It's fundamentalist in that these are the so-called biblical truths, and this is what we say they mean, and this is what you will believe. If you thought that there may be some kind of intellectual extension of that, which is normally found in evangelicalism, in my research, I'm finding that people are not given those opportunities. What is seen as matters of salvation seems to be a very broad spectrum. It's not just belief in Jesus, as it were. It seems to be belief in male headship, uh, belief in particular um, relationships between men and women. It seems to be related to the heterosexual norm. It's got an anti-gay element to it. So that is the way I'm understanding fundamentalism in this city particularly. How is it then that the, the Sydney form of Anglicanism mm. became the archetype for the sort of fundamentalism that you're concerned with? Well, in simple terms, most of my research participants had come from Sydney, grew up in Sydney. And so this was a specific microculture, if you like, or microcosm of fundamentalism. And Sydney, as people will know, is quite different in its expression of Anglicanism than, say, Perth or Melbourne or other cities. And the Sydney people would mm. reject quite vigorously the label fundamentalist. They say, no, we're rigorously intellectual. We study the Bible and are most assiduous in making sure of the historical and yes. contextual stuff we're talking about. Yes, and I think that there would be people who would say that to me. And there are people who would actually be committed to that and adhere to that intellectual rigour. So I'm not here to critique each and every person in the Sydney diocese, but I would say that there are significant pockets where that is just not allowed. When you set out to write this book, what was the journey that you wished to explore and what have you concluded at the end of that journey? Well, of course, this is framed in my own journey to be um, transparent about this. And my own journey at times was very painful, very circuitous out of it. So I guess I was interested, you know, in understanding my own journey, but I was also wanting to see what was it like for other people. Was there a common thread that emerged from all of them, even those who still remained in church and those who now find themselves utterly away from religion? Well, it's interesting. The common thread is... I mean, these are people who all left fundamentalist churches. The common thread was very much people's views about male-female relationships, husband-wife roles, and particularly about how gay people were treated. But another very common thread was this idea of this self-replication. I think one of the research participants called it a groupthink or attack of the clones, that you were kind of uh, self-replicating uh, what was seen as kind of an acceptable way of being. And lots of people became very canny, started to critique that, and eventually protested it by leaving. Most kids would go through that sort of process in just growing up. That is <laughs> challenging parents, challenging school, yeah. challenging faith community. Mm. Mm. I guess the problem is, how do you discern when it's unhealthy? Look, everybody's got to decide that for themselves. And certainly there are going to be women that will say to you and will say to me that, you know, the church has given them great meaning. 
and a sense of sisterly solidarity and security in their marriage and in their family. And I would not be disputing that. I'm not speaking for everybody. But there are equally, for example, a number of women that have stayed in very oppressive and psychologically damaging relationships for far too long because they think that submission and subjugation is the way they should be living. There are gay people who are living a celibate life for their whole life because they are understanding that this is the only way they can be Christian. As I say, I think that it comes down to a question of you having that freedom at times to wonder. I think it's to do with reflecting. And once we have stopped reflecting, then, you know, we're kind of not living anymore. Give us a couple of what you think are the most telling examples of this journey. There was a young man in the study by the name of Charlie who spoke really articulately about the way he understood the church as similar to a OH and S community in that everybody's always looking for the danger. And this was a very good way of explaining the whole questions of cloning as he understood it and groupthink, that people are always being forced towards a particular point of view. His life went in a particular direction that was very difficult for him until he eventually redefined his faith and remained in the church, but right away from the fundamentalist church. There were other women, and I'm thinking particularly of gay women, who described a form of internalised homophobia. That is, that, you know, homophobia or a complete intolerance of gay sexual practice was perpetuated in the church. And so to be acceptable in that church, you really had to deny uh, your sexuality. And that's extremely painful for people. Just tell us a little bit about yourself in that context. I mean, how deeply enmeshed in the, the Sydney Anglican tradition were you? Oh, I was very enmeshed. I think in my heyday, I was making evangelical videos about how to speak to people about becoming a Christian. So my exit has been very profound and I have lost community. I have lost friendships. It's been pretty painful at times. And at times I felt frankly scared about speaking out, which says something about the tendrils of power in my view. You use the word tendrils there. In your narrative, you use the word, rather than hierarchies and controlling, you use the word network, that this operates as a web rather than a hierarchy. I think this is a really important thing for people to be thinking about, that power does work in this chain-like, net-like way rather than in a specifically hierarchical way. It can work in a hierarchical way, but through the small group Bible studies, through the one-on-one -on -one meetings with people, through the so-called informal counselling, there is a way of experiencing and exerting power right throughout the social body of the church. When did the questions first begin to occur for you and what was the key one? A very key moment for me was when the minister of my church at the time visited my home. I was married at the time and reading a lot of alternative, but not that radical books about alternative roles for women in church. And I was told until the early hours of the morning that I really should not be reading these books when I had been told on other occasions that I needed to keep questioning this idea that we've talked about, about intellectual freedom. What was taught on one hand was actually being dismissed. And I think I became very aware at that time that the tendrils of power were over me. Now, this is many years before I left. And that began the journey. Look, it did. And I think, you know, the death of my sister, who was a very key person in my life, probably sealed the deal. And I realised then that a lot of the things that she had said to me over the years were probably very true about the nature of the church, about the nature of power. 
John Cleary speaking with Josie McSkimming about her new book, Leaving Christian Fundamentalism. And you're with me, Andrew West, on RN, Radio Australia, News Radio Online, and you can download or podcast us at any time.